One of the things about the church, the family of God, the people of God, is that we are called to be one. We're called to be united. And this was a struggle, even in the earliest churches of uh, the history of the church. If you read your New Testament, you'll see that there were struggles with this early on. And those struggles led to regular exhortations in the biblical witness to be unified, to maintain the unity that is a gift given to us by the Spirit of God. So just two examples of that. One from the letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Or Paul writing to the church in Rome that was having some issues of agreement there. There was some splintering going on between the strong and the weak. And they had differing opinions about things that they thought were very central and important. That should sound familiar. And he writes these words. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. In accord with Christ Jesus. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. With one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are just two examples. There are so many more. There's a lot of data in the biblical witness about calling us to express our unity in Jesus in a deep way. And most of it, of course, is found in the New Testament. But our psalm today, Psalm 133, which is the text for our time together, the next psalm and the psalms of ascents that we've been studying over the summer, the 14th out of the 15 is a psalm all about unity. It's an Old Testament affirmation of the unity of God's people. And it's simple and powerful. And we'll explore this together today. A teaching, again, that's not difficult, but that is profound and that is profoundly challenging to all of us in our moment. And when I say our moment, let me explain. I mean the highly polarized cultural environment in which we all find ourselves. This polarization is fracturing churches across our nation and certainly beyond, over and over again. And we are not immune to these pressures, either here at Park Street Church or in any of the other churches in the city that we partner with who proclaim the gospel of Jesus. In fact, we all feel them deeply because they are in our midst. We feel them, many of us in the church, we feel them in our families, we feel them among our friend groups, it's different, and it makes this challenging in new ways. I've read a couple of articles recently that point to this difficult context. The first is called The Splintering of the Evangelical Soul, and it was published on April 16th by Tim Dalrymple, the CEO and president of Christianity Today. And this is his opening statement. New fractures are forming within the American evangelical movement, Fractures that do not run along the usual regional, denominational, ethnic, or political lines. Couples, families, friends, and congregations once united in their commitment to Christ are now dividing over seemingly irreconcilable views of the world. In fact, they're not merely dividing, but becoming incomprehensible to one another. The second article is called The Six-Way Fracturing of Evangelicalism, and it was published on June 7th by Michael Graham with Schuyler Flowers. And they do a taxonomy of the evangelical movement and talk about it fracturing into six different groups on the basis not due of any, to any loosening grip on gospel essentials, but due to political, cultural, and socioeconomic differences. A quote from that article, The tectonic plates are shifting underfoot. This fracturing will likely be irrevocable, not because our gospel essentials are not unifying enough, but because the divergence of ethical priorities, cultural engagement, racial attitudes, political visions slash illusions, and their implications for philosophy of ministry mean that unity is fundamentally no longer tenable, end quote. What both of these articles are picking up on is that this is an unusual time in our history for the church, and particularly for the church uh, that is referred to in these articles as the evangelical church that Park Street stands in the stream of, which is a church that affirms the authority of Scripture and the centrality of a relationship with Jesus as our Lord and King. Even these churches, those in this movement, are fracturing 
because of these realities culturally, socially, and politically around us. So it's a challenging time for us to embody the oneness of God's people, but it's incredibly important, central. It matters deeply to God. It matters deeply to me as well. When I was uh, a young man being called into ministry by God during that season of wrestling with him, the verse that he inscribed upon my heart was the verse that we read out of John chapter 17 today from Jesus's high priestly prayer the night before he was crucified, where he prays to the Father about us, those who would come to know him and believe in him. He says that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. This verse has so deeply impacted my ministry over the years. Our unity has a missional purpose, Jesus prays here. It matters. It shows to the world that the church, the gathered people of God who have faith in Jesus Christ is not just a sociological phenomenon, but it's a supernatural reality because look at how it breaks down the barriers that splinter us out in the world. But in the church, you find people from all different walks of life and different perspectives and different political thoughts and ideological views coming together because we're united in one whose name is Jesus. And this is to show to the world, Jesus says. This is why he prays this the night before he's crucified. It's to show to the world that you, Father, sent me, he says, into the world. That this is a supernatural divine reality that I really did come from above to make something new and to reconcile all things. It matters deeply for our witness into the city, into our nation, into the world, this subject of the unity of God's people. So let's not think that it's just a marginal topic. It's not. It's very central to God's own heart and to the New Testament. And as we see here even, of course, to the Old Testament in Psalm 133. The missional power of unity is, is, is real, but the converse is also true. I had lunch with a friend that I studied with over in England, one of the nicest people that I know and the smartest people that I know. And he had grown up in the church and walked away from his faith in high school and has yet to come back. And we were talking, he knew, he knew I was a pastor, of course, we had studied together and we were talking about um, the work and ministry and Jesus. And, 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 and I was telling him about the compelling nature of these things in my experience, and he just said, well, look, Mark, if it's really true, then why are there over 38,000 denominations in the world? And he just kind of stuck his finger. It's a hard question. And it's the converse of what Jesus prays in John 17 is, as we splinter, it gives people who are not a part of this community a reason to say, well, look, it's just a bunch of people like each other, who like each other. It's just a human phenomenon, a sociological reality. It's not really something that has divine power. And that's what he was saying to me. And of course, I have my answers for those questions. If you want to talk about those afterwards, we can. But the reality is that sin still impacts the church and we're never going to walk into this ideal as we are called to on the pages of scripture. And they didn't in the very beginning. And we should take some comfort from that fact, but never rest in it. But it is nonetheless, it's a deep scandal to the gospel, the divided church. And I would say to you that I believe it's the thing, one of the things that most grieves the heart of our God is when he looks out upon his people on this earth and sees us fighting, dividing, and devouring one another instead of loving. And Jesus says we're supposed to be known by our love for one another. So it's deeply important. And our enemy knows this as well, if I can speak on this level for just a moment. He will use anything and everything that he can to take the church and splinter it apart. He's used the Lord's Supper, which is this beautiful sacrament that we've been given that is to unify the church. And there's been tomes written about how we disagree over what it, what it signifies and what's going on. And we've divided. There's baptism. We've divided over that in our history. There are issues of musical preference that can divide churches and cause us to look at, upon one another with suspicion. The enemy will use anything, often very good things, to try to drive a wedge between the people of God because he knows just how powerful this witness is of the unity of the church. We had a great time, as I said, at, at all church camp. And one of the um, children's lessons that was taught by Christina, who does our children's ministry, was uh, she used the prop of a puzzle and all the kids got a different piece of the puzzle. 
And if you think about this for a minute, you know, different pieces of the puzzle can have a little bit of beauty to themselves. They have color and often, you know, maybe a little bit of an image and they, they can have something of beauty. But when they come together, the picture that in, the, in this case, it was the it was the temple of the Lord that we, they put a puzzle together. But when they come together, they make this brilliant picture the witness of which is so much more clear and vivid and powerful than any individual piece on its own. And I would use that as a way of thinking about the church, the people of God, as we come together, we create this beautiful and clear picture that is compelling to the watching world. So it's a challenging time, though, for us to embody our oneness. And yet, of course, it, it, uh, it does deeply matter. And so Psalm 133, to pick up our psalm, Uh, celebrates the reality of the unity of God's people in a wonderful way. And as we think about this psalm, I want you to to sit with this question of whether or not you and your part, if you're a follower of Jesus here, if you're here just exploring the Christian faith, we're glad that you're here. This this does have something to do with you as well. I hope to say more about that in a moment. But what, what for your part, are you participating in the expression of the unity of God's people? Or are you contributing to our, fraction, our, our fact, uh, fracturing as a people? Will you make every effort, as Paul says, to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace? So Psalm 133, it's simple. A main clause, verse 1, then supported by two similes in verses 2 and 3, and then a final concluding statement at the end of verse 3. And I want us to just look at this briefly together uh, and see this celebration of unity that we find here in the Old Testament. So verse one, be how, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. unity. Good and pleasant. These two adjectives that describe the dwelling together of brothers in unity. These two adjectives are used to describe the Lord himself in Psalm 135 verse three. And then they're also used to describe praising God in Psalm 147 verse 1. This is something that is really good and pleasant, the psalmist says. Now it's likely that this was initially an expression about the family unit, but given the context of this psalm and the psalms of a sense, we're right to see this as pointing beyond just the family to this deeper communal connection and community of the people of God as they dwell together. Remember, these are psalms that are said as they're on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so they're gathering in this this city where God's temple dwells, where God's presence resides. And they're gathering at one of the three annual festivals of the year to worship him and to celebrate and to feast together. And it's that picture of the people of God having having gathered from all these different regions together in Jerusalem to worship their, their, their Lord upon which this is pronounced, this this pronouncement of of good and pleasant when they are together. So this main clause, this affirmation of the goodness and pleasantness of the unity of God's people is then supported and and deepened in these two similes that come in verses two and three, both of which are meant to communicate the magnitude of blessing that falls upon the unified people of God. The first is about oil being poured out on the, on the head. And uh, if you were to show up at somebody's house today and they poured oil on your head, I'd expect you wouldn't be that excited about it. But in the ancient culture, this was a, a sign of hospitality and of blessing. And so this was a sign of abundance uh, in the ancient world. And it's a sign of blessing and goodness as this oil flows out. The, the second simile in verse three is, is taking a picture from the sphere of creation Um, And it says the unity of God's people is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Mount Hermon was 120 miles north of Jerusalem, a much higher peak and known for its copious amounts of dew in the morning. Our family just went backpacking in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, normally the pretty dry Rocky Mountains, but they were actually, it's been a wet summer out there. There was all kinds of wildflowers and mushrooms this big uh, all throughout the forest. I'd never seen it before in all my years of hiking out there from the wetness of of the summer. And we woke up in the early mornings and there was dew all over the ground. And this simile here in in verse three is about that dew of Hermon being transported to the southerly lower region of the mountains around Jerusalem and falling upon those mountains, creating a sense of, of blessing because that dew, that water supports all the vegetation and the different kinds of life on the mountains. This abundance of moisture will lead to life and fruitfulness. So abundant oil and abundant dew flowing down from above. The Hebrew word for flowing down or falling down is used three times, repeated three times in this psalm. 
this kind of repetition that's, that's often found in the Psalms of Ascents, as a way of picturing the fact that the blessing, which is mentioned in the final words of the Psalm, is poured down from God out of heaven upon his unified people. Like oil and like dew are poured down, so the blessing of God is poured down upon his people. Before looking at that final sentence of the psalm, though, I do want to say that these two similes about oil and dew actually point themselves to a slightly deeper meaning that's connected to the importance of the unity of God's people. This picture of oil running down on the beard, well, the the beard is identified very explicitly in our psalm as the beard of Aaron, which raises the picture of the ordination of the Aaronic priest in the people of God. This is talked about, written about in Leviticus chapter 8, and oil is used there in the ordination service of setting apart the priest for his work among the people. And it's as if the simile is actually communicating that not just about the priest Aaron, but you, the people of God, have been set apart. You've been sanctified for a purpose and a calling that's distinct and unique in this world. And it's a way of connecting this reality of you being set apart and fulfilling that calling as a set apart people with the reality of our unity together, of dwelling together in unity. It is as if to say that as we dwell together in unity, we are able to fulfill that unique calling of who we are as the people of God who have been set apart for a purpose. This unity enables that. And if that was true for the Israelites in the Old Testament, how much more true is it for us who are in Christ in the New Testament? We've been set apart to demonstrate the power of the gospel, a gospel that has at its heart the reconciling of all things in Jesus the King. Sin is what fractures relationships. Sin sin fractures our relationship with the God who made us. And sin fractures our relationship with one another. We see this taking place in Genesis chapter 3 and then being played out throughout the history of humanity. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's his life, death, and resurrection that then create a, a different kind of force in the world that's undoing the splintering reality of sin and drawing us together again under one king, one head, who is Jesus. All of this brokenness, and many of us feel this in our own loneliness or sense of isolation. And if you're here this morning exploring the Christian faith, I would say to you, one of the things that's that's so beautiful in the offer of the gospel is that you've been invited to be a part of a unified family of people where our relationships are defined by service and sacrifice and bearing one another's burdens in a community of people who deeply love one another because we have been deeply loved. This is what we are to embody to you as someone exploring the Christian faith and to the city around us that is broken and fractured and polarized. We're to embody something different. We fulfill our calling, that is, this being set apart as we walk forward in unity together. And that first simile about this oil points to that. The second simile about dew also points to something deeper. It points to this reality of fruitfulness and fruit bearing because the dew sustains life. And we've been called to bear fruit, to bear much fruit, Jesus says. It's as if the psalm is encouraging us to think about our dwelling together in unity as something that enables us to bear fruit as the people of God. To bear witness to him in a way that matters and makes a difference in our world. So these two similes about oil and dew point to these deeper realities. And then the psalmist concludes with this verse, with the the last half of verse three, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The there here in this part of verse three is pointing back to Zion, back to Jerusalem. But more deeply than just pointing to this geographic location, it's pointing to the people of God gathered together in worship before the Lord. For there, on those unified people in worship before the living God in his presence, the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. God showers all of his blessings down upon his unified people. Life itself, like he showers, like oil is poured out on the beard of Aaron, or like dew comes down on the Mount Mount Hermon. So Psalm 133 has both this pronouncement in verse 1 that dwelling together in unity is good and pleasant. And then the declaration that it's here upon this unified people in Zion in the presence of God among 
his people who are gathered in his presence and worshiping him, that God has commanded blessings to be poured out, including even, he says, life forevermore. God pours out his blessings upon his unified people. I wonder, do we need any greater encouragement? Do we even need the New Testament to encourage us to be a unified people as the people of God? Don't we long for God and for his blessings? Don't we long for life forevermore? Well, this psalm encourages us to say, you find that as you gather together in the presence of God. We don't do that in Jerusalem anymore. We do that in the church. We gather together here and we are the new temple. We are the place where God dwells and we find life and blessing. But as I said earlier, even if the psalm encourages us to pursue this unity, it is obviously not easy for us to do so. We easily dismiss people. We are slow to forgive when we're hurt. We tend to think that we see things correctly and maybe we see things the only way they should be seen. We find it easy to dismiss people who view the world differently than we do, perhaps because they stand or sit in a different location and have a different vantage point. And on top of all of this, I should say that the present manifestation of this kind of sin of of fracturing and splintering, what I would say is a very diabolical one, is this polarized culture in which we find ourselves today as a church. In illustrating the divisions that we face, Tim Dalrymple in the article I mentioned earlier writes this, Quote, one group within American evangelicalism believes our religious liberties have never been more firmly established. Another, that they have never been at greater risk. One group believes racism is still systemic in American society. Another, that the systemic racism push is a progressive program to redistribute wealth and power to angry radicals. One is more concerned with the insurrection at the Capitol. Another, with the riots that followed the killing of George Floyd. One believes the Trump presidency was generationally damaging to Christian witness. Another, that it was enormously beneficial. One believes the former president attempted a coup. Another, that the Democrats stole the election. One believes masks and vaccines are marks of Christian love. Another, that the rejection of the same is a mark of Christian courage. Now, as I read that quote out, I'm very confident that some of you were saying amen to one half of those sentences. (laughs) And some of you were like, yeah, we got the other half. And that's the reality in which we find ourselves in our culture. So this is my question. With these cultural, social, and political realities pushing the church apart, and it's happening all over, how will we as a church respond to those pressures? I mean this seriously. How will we as a church respond to these fracturing tendencies in our culture that are impacting the evangelical church of our day? Will we become just another illustration of the fracturing that takes place all around us? Or will we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, walk in a new way, in unity together, demonstrating that something holds us together, and that is, of course, the gospel and Jesus himself, more than anything that can drive us apart? Because that's the challenge that we face. Will we hear the declaration of Psalm 133 of how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters in Christ dwell together in unity? And will we make every effort to maintain that unity in the spirit, in the bond of peace? That's the question that we face. Well, let me offer then a few suggestions as to how we might do that as God's people in the 21st century in a polarized culture and society. The first thing I would say is we affirm what Psalm 133 affirms and what God himself affirms, which is just how deeply good and and, and, and amazing and precious is this unity that we've been given in Jesus. We say that God, what you have said is so beautiful and good and central to your people and to your mission is something that we then will say is so good and beautiful to us. More beautiful and more good to us perhaps than our opinions on these different issues over which we strongly disagree. And we put that into practice, but it starts with an affirmation. We don't somehow relegate the unity of the church to some sort of side thing that we think, well, if we can get there, that's okay. But if not, that's just the way it's going to be. No, we say this is central to God's witness and heart and his gospel. It's affirmed here in Psalm 133 and we too will affirm that and then begin to walk accordingly. That is, we value God's opinion more than our own. 
Second, we grow in this affirmation of God's opinion by saturating ourselves with the biblical witness and not with a polarizing media reality that we all face because we all are saturated with that every day. We have to counter those impacts by saturating ourselves in the word of God, which as we do so continues to teach us about the heart of this beautiful gospel that we proclaim week to week, that in Jesus's flesh on the cross, the dividing wall of hostility was broken down between Jew and Gentile, that out of his body, he might create one new humanity unified under his lordship. This is the great mystery, Paul says in Ephesians 3, that we would, that Gentiles are heirs with grace, uh, heirs of grace with the Jews. And we're called to be one family now under Jesus as king. And as we saturate ourselves with the biblical witness, we are reminded again and again of the gospel and of its heart, of, of its power to unify people from all different walks of life into one family that is a radical, countercultural, sacrificial community that's rooted in love, the love of God for us our love for one another, and then, of course, our love for our neighbor. As we saturate ourselves in the word, Jesus and the cross will be our focus. Paul says, look, I resolved to know nothing while I was among you. You divided Corinthians. This is back to 1 Corinthians 1. I said I would know nothing while I was in your presence except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul was clear about his message and his mission. And as we saturate ourselves with the scriptures, we will become clear about our message and our mission. We will know nothing but Christ and him crucified. And that will help us draw together. Our primary allegiance, that is, is to a crucified king, not to a political platform or an ideology or a particular solution to a real problem. Those things are, I'm not saying those things are unimportant or that they don't matter, they do. And I think there's good reasons for us to argue about them and debate them in the body of Christ. But they never become our priority. Our primary allegiance is Christ and him crucified. And as we debate those other things, will we remain unified? That's the question. So I'm saying that we saturate ourselves with scripture. And in that we draw together a clarity about our mission, our message, and what drives us together, which is Jesus. Then third, with that focus and that clarity, we can then realize that we can live with disagreement with brothers and sisters in Christ without letting that disagreement, even on matters that we hold dear, become a wedge that the devil uses to drive us apart. Because when we let him do that, we just play into his hands. But we learn that we can hold those things. We can hold different positions. We have different consciences on certain matters. That's Romans 14 and the beginning of Romans 15. And we can still hold together because what drives us together, Jesus himself, is far more central in our lives than anything that pushes us apart. The fourth thing I would say is we grow in humility. And we've seen this as a part of the series on the Psalms of Ascent. It's come up again. It's not explicit in Psalm 133, but it's very clear in Psalm 131 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. But we grow in humility because what is necessary for us to live together in such a polarized culture? It is to be humble. It is to suspect and be suspicious of our own position more than we are of our neighbors. And it is our humility that allows us not to build straw men and to tear them down in argumentation, but to consider the strongest and best argument of someone who sees something different from us. And even to seek to learn from that person and how they see the world. That kind of humility will enable us to walk together in unity. A couple more things. Fifth, we become quick forgivers. We learn how to forgive. And we learn how to acknowledge our faults, our sharp tongues, our disunifying actions very quickly. And to go to that person and say, I'm sorry. I did this or I said this in a way that I shouldn't have. Would you please forgive me? And when somebody comes to us like that, we give them quick forgiveness. We don't withhold it like we would long to receive if we had gone to someone asking for that forgiveness because God forgives us. And all of this, this is the sixth point and really the final one, and it's really all of them together, is we walk by the Spirit of God. This is all the work of the Spirit. When you read about the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, you read about the person of God dwelling among his people, 
And the fruit of the Spirit produces things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These realities that actually enable a diverse people to walk together. The Holy Spirit is the one who, when he works in us, and when we allow him to lead us, enables us to have the kinds of disposition that enable us to actually hold together amidst differences and debates and to grow in love with one another. The Spirit enables us to bear with one another, to forgive each other, to be compassionate and caring and kind toward one another. No, this vision of unity that we get here in Psalm 133 and that we get all throughout the New Testament is a vision that's impossible, humanly speaking. And we should all just admit that. It's a great place to start. Look, I, we can't do this. But it's a vision that's entirely possible by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we're repeatedly exhorted again and again in the New Testament, walk not according to the flesh, not by the flesh, but by the Spirit. And as we walk by the Spirit, I trust, not only will those things develop in us, those character traits that enable us to hold together, but also we will be empowered. Spirit is divine empowerment to live this new radical life of love that we are called to live as the church. And we'll be able to walk into that. We cannot dwell together in unity outside of the Spirit's power. So this is important work. This is work that we should all be passionate about. And this is work that I think is incredibly relevant to our moment. And I want to encourage us, Park Street Church, as the family of God, to be eager and to make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. To lean into our call as the people of God. We actually have a unique opportunity as a, fairly, as a very broad church because one of the effects of this polarization in the culture and it's going on in the church is we just leave each other and we go to churches where people have the same ideology that we do so that we don't have to sit next to people that we completely disagree with. But you know, at Park Street, God has blessed us with great diversity and a tremendous opportunity to walk through a season of polarization in our culture and say, no, we're going to hold together in, in prioritizing Jesus as Lord and what unites us being stronger than what could divide us. And as we do that together, God will be honored and glorified. He will. And it will be a profound witness to our city, to our nation and beyond. This is not easy work, but it's spirit led work that allows us then as one people to engage the issues of the day, even as we may disagree over them, in a way that brings out glory for God. And that is the reality. This unified people wrestling in this way together is the reality that Psalm 133 says, upon which the Lord pours out his blessing. So all of that to say, we have a great opportunity to be blessed by God as we walk forward in a unified fashion as his people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this little psalm over which you pronounce tremendous blessing, goodness and pleasantness upon your people dwelling together in unity. Forgive us, Lord, for all the ways that we violate your heart. Give us, O oh Lord, grace and humility to walk with one another that with one voice we might glorify you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you would pour out your spirit afresh and anew upon us as your people. And we ask this for the glory and honor and praise of your Son, in whose name we pray.